What's going on, guys? It's Frito here for your Overwatch. Lead hero designer Alec Dawson went to Twitter following the Twitter spaces, following up in a short Ask Me Anything almost, covering a bunch of questions about the philosophy of how they're going about balancing Overwatch 2 and a lot of heroes that are sort of being forgotten at the moment, I think. What they're looking at next and what to expect for Season 2. In the tweets, Alec Dawson also dropped some hints for new heroes coming to tank and support, what we should start thinking about, what those kits might look like. I mean, he's the guy who's going to be in charge of that, right? So you want to carefully listen to what he's saying in some of these. We'll break down all of it after this quick message. Today's video sponsor is the Over Overwatch League. The tournament starts today and the grand finals are on November 4th. The absolute best gameplay Overwatch 2 has to offer is streaming this week and you're not going to want to miss it. And there's a lot of viewership rewards for you to cash in as well. As always, you can link your account and tune in all week, accumulating Overwatch League tokens, which you can cash in for some of the best skins in the game. But also they're bringing back the three for three drop. For every three hours you watch, you get three home and away skins capped out at 30 hours. Also for watching, there's in-game rewards for Overwatch 2, Diablo, and Hearthstone. But in any case, you're definitely going to want to pick up these skins for Zenyatta and Reaper. These are the ones I've been using personally. They're my favorite for the characters. Also, you can use the Overwatch League website to fill out your pick and bracket. If you get it perfect, you can win $100,000, which is unlikely. But if you get the best bracket, you at least get a cool 5000 The tournament starts today, so start tuning in to the Overwatch League. I'll leave the link in the description. And be sure not to miss the finals on November 4th. I've organized the subjects based on themes that you should be able to follow along in the chapter markers if you're interested. When to expect patches. Normally, they want to do a future mid-season patch with balance updates that happen four weeks after a season start. But due to technical limitations, they had to delay this one. On Reddit, Bill Warnecki explains that it's a bit more complicated with cross-play and cross-progression, which requires scheduling because they have to do both a client and server-side update. I feel the community's frustration frustration because I thought a bunch of work they put through in Overwatch 1 was so that they could hotfix the game and make balance changes faster. So I'm a little confused, but also I know nothing about game development. Hopefully for season two, they can be more on the schedule that they're aiming for. More on communication. Remember, Alec Dawson is the new guy hired for the lead hero design role. And if I had to guess, I'd say being more communicative is part of that as a job requirement nowadays. You remarked on the Twitter spaces stream and said it went rather well. Hopefully they can make that a scheduled chat. So maybe a regular thing that they check in for 30 minutes on a regular basis. Say that from the design side, they'll probably see some blog posts that dive deeper into their philosophies, which coincide with both the design of new heroes, but also balancing the current ones. When asked about balance, Alec Dawson says it's a combination of intuition and feedback and data, which is essentially the same thing that Jeff Kaplan described it as many years ago as the triangle of things they look at. Alex says here, we try to look at changes that account for how that character is being played across ranks that can differ greatly and retain character identity. Now, I know a lot of you top-down balanced disciples will have a lot to say about how that sounds, but he'll get to that in just a moment, a few sections later, so hold your comments. More on general philosophy, though. He gets asked about, are you able to gather enough data on new heroes considering they will be locked behind a battle pass, implying that less players will be able to play them? So how are you going to actually know if they're balanced or not? Alec responds in saying there's no concerns because they get tons of feedback and data immediately with new heroes. And then even more when they enter competitive, which will be two weeks after they're released. This is a bit of a softball. It's not like he's going to say locking heroes through a battle pass makes them unbalanceable. If they thought that, they surely would not have done that. Alec gets asked about low pick rate heroes and what the dev team's thought process is on them. He responds in saying, it's okay to have niche heroes, but it raises questions. Is the kit lacking? Are players tired of the kit? Outside of win rate changes, enjoy a hero, but has a low pick rate, it might mean they're less likely to do something, which is to say niche heroes are fine as long as it's a fun hero. But if players do not enjoy the hero and it has a low pick rate, they're more likely to do something. Keep that in mind with further points he makes later. When asked about balancing every month, why not do it every two weeks, which other game companies do, Alex says they believe that this cadence is good. It allows metas to develop and gives us enough time to have changes we are confident in by gathering data, coming up with changes, playtesting 
them getting info from that triangle. They will note that these are our schedule changes, but if anything were very out of line, we'd step in ASAP. Now, debatable whether uh, some characters right now would fit that description. Maybe, uh, I think it's safe to say that in rank, Zarya and Sojourn might fit that description for some players. But in any case, speaking about Sojourn, that of course is the hot button issue because that's a character that isn't even getting nerfed in the delayed patch. And the comments he made on the Twitter spaces, I think got blown out of proportion a little bit. So to clarify, he said, yes, we are balancing top down, but they try to find a way that won't gut the hero or butcher them at lower ranks. It's hard to do, but that's the goal. He specifically says she's on top of mind, Sojourn is, particularly looking at her one-shot capability without losing hero identity too much. So if Sojourn is a character about a railgun, she probably should be able to use it, right? A change I saw Q tweet out is suggesting that Holding her railgun for eight seconds sounds ridiculous, and I agree. Why can't she just roam around with that thing after farming a tank? In general, a cool thing they did about Overwatch 2 is that there isn't much punishment for a tank to stand in front and scout the battlefield and take some damage due to the reduction of armor, as well as the enemy gains less ult off you anyway, but Sojourn is the one example of you really get punished. Well, I should say your team does if you face tank into the Sojourn and and I think that is some unfortunate gameplay design that they might have to think about where simply just trying to hold the front line as a tank feeds Sojourn a eight second holding rail that she can then flank your team and one shot them and the whole team fight falls apart. And that's not so nice. We said this in our previous video, but the thing that I am expecting them to do is make her reliability and sort of just general easy pressure, probably from her primary fire, a little bit more effective and make the railgun significantly less effective or at least less important for her kit. If they did that and removed the headshot from the railgun when she's not using overclock, I still think she could be a very good character in a normal neutral fight and have those pop off moments with the ult, still be about the railgun, not lose the hero identity, be fun to play, challenging and pick her performance up a little bit at the lower tiers. The way Sojourn is good, I also kind of don't like for the previously stated reasons. Further changes to season two. They keep talking about this DPS passive that gives you speed and reload speed after an elimination. Alec Dawson says the DPS passive is on top of the list for changes in season two for reasons you bring up. The reason they're looking to change it is because it inadvertently helps flankers far more. Alec agrees with that, but also there's a sentiment that it is harder to aim with on certain heroes. So for example, Widowmaker getting a random burst of speed she's not ready for when she contributes to an elimination might make her next follow-up shot she's going for way too hard and miss it on accident because all those muscle memories are so fine-tuned. While it doesn't matter so much when you're on a flanker type character, on her it does. Maybe they just remove the move speed entirely. But specifically, he says, with a hero like Genji, they wouldn't like revert the nerfs they're putting through on this patch with the passive. They might wait and see instead. And that's sort of the answer with a few of these things where they want to test out a new change and wait and see rather than be too proactive and assume Genji needs that damage back in order to compensate for losing the bias of the passive. It's all a crazy balancing act, isn't it? Alec gets asked about Bastion, who is a hero that is underperforming other DPS, maybe even less effective than in Overwatch 1. I don't know, I think that's a bit debatable. I think he's low-key one of the few DPS that can actually punish some of the more aggressive tanks. A lot of players are asking like, how do you counter Zarya? Well, baiting her into a barrage of bullets on a power angle, bursting the bubble when you can. Bastion's a bit underrated, I think, to make Azaria think twice about hard Wing your team and backline. But funnily enough, Alex says here that Bastion bug where players could have effectively infinite artillery fire, so much so that they had to remove him from the game for a few weeks. He says it was actually quite eye-opening because players still avoided it. Imagine the ult being so bad that it's like 10 times better and you still can't get kills with it. Okay, so I think you can like combo it with grav and maybe another ult or two, but the artillery is not that great. Alex says a few changes they have in mind, but we want to shorten the window before the projectile drops so players can feel more effective during configuration artillery. More changes, Symmetra. They've got some tweaks coming to season two, but he does say that she is doing quite well across most of our ranks. 
in the right hands. We've seen players find great usage with her current kit. She does, however, have a low pick rate, and we hear a lot of feedback about her. Expect to see some small tweaks to her kit in season two. Ugh. I don't know what they do with Sim Man. I'm not a fan of how her best play is to steal the objective away faster than the enemy can get to it and camp it. I think the reason why she sees use is Corne. So back to their design triangle, while the win rate on certain scenarios might be fine, I think the interactivity of her kit is just boring. It's like she's either hard countered or kind of lame the way she wins. I think it's about time for a fourth or fifth Symmetra overhaul and rework. When asked about Tracer, Alex says she's been overshadowed by some of the other flankers in the hero lineup so far due to meta and other hero strength, but they believe she will find a home slash composition with these changes as in the nerfs that are coming up and others coming. If she doesn't, we'll be taking a closer look at her. And this is pretty core to my reasoning for not being too worried about the Genji nerfs is because I think Tracer being as difficult to play as they made her is actually a better benchmark for where DPS should land in Overwatch 2. Tracer's a character that's like super oppressive with her positioning and getting in but her damage isn't gonna overwhelm you and easily mow things down. I kind of like that. And when Genji's a bit weaker, it allows for these DPS picks to have actually a higher skill expression where rather than having just raw numbers to insta shot supports there's more interplay with the rest of the game so i think tracer is one of those underrated picks that you might want to consider to go hunt down super nimble characters like kiriko and sojourn at the highest tiers they might still be able to headshot you but for most players tracer zipping around is still going to do some work on them in a 1v1 so that's my take on that a comment about new support heroes let's pay attention to this he says yes balancing out the cast is one of our long-term focuses aaron keller spoke about this before right now the pool is quite small for two players to choose from as in the support cast may see more new supports than other roles to bolster that pool also there's lots of interesting design space for us to explore as designers when making supports huh interesting space or design space what this term means is a gap in things they could explore new combinations of things either we already have but more likely new things that we haven't seen before. So what I mean is, I think it's unlikely that we get a support character that can insta-save you with a Batiste Lamp or Kiriko Suzu. And we probably have enough at this point, Lucio Speed Boost and Kiriko Ult Speed Boost. I bet they try to fill out that design space a little bit more and get more supportive kits that is either like, let's say two thirds a combination of things you already know, but with like one dramatic new thing. That's kind of my thought process because if you look at Kiriko I sort of see it as like well what if Zen could like flank your backline all right and what if she had a big clutch play like Bap did but she's got a speed boost like Lucio and it sort of combines into this new thing that's what I think they're doing for new heroes in general and I'm curious what you guys think let me know in the comment section down below what is the design space he's talking about what could a new support hero do in Overwatch 2? Alec gets asked if supports will ever be given more damage in order to defend themselves from enemy DPS. Alec says defending yourself as support can come through in a variety of ways. We want to be careful with just buffing their damage as they just turn into DPS heroes with healing, which some people might say they already are. <laughs> Movement is a much safer option as it keeps the support tank DPS paradigm intact, which maybe is what they have in spades with Kiriko. You want to defend yourself as a support We'll just blink away. I think it's a little bit harder to say that for characters like Ana and Zen who have no movement. Maybe Zen just needs to be able to float in air a little bit over gaps or something. Maybe that would be a cool movement passive for him. And why can't Ana wall climb, but Kiroko can? Anyway, random complaints. I wouldn't be surprised to see some things like this, to be honest, based on what he's saying here. The reason is a movement option is something you have to actively use and think about and is naturally interactive because the enemy progresses towards you you move away or you position ahead of time it's all tactical there's nothing free about it other than you know maybe you get to positions other players can't but i think we're kind of moving past that as like a balancing knob in overwatch 2 just based on how the maps expect you to be able to play anyway it made a little bit more sense when we played assault where you literally were just intended to like defend one spot all game right 
Whereas now all the modes have you moving. We'll see. I don't know if I'm reading into that too much, if that means they'll think about movement options for other heroes or if just buffing movement is something they consider. It's hard for me to say because I find the support role to be the easiest route to power without needing more skill because they have so many good buttons and your positioning can really take you far. Alec gets asked if there will be changes to Mercy coming. He says, overall, players are still learning and adjusting to her new movement capabilities. We want to give that a little bit of time and see how those learnings translate to win rate. May see some small tweaks through that time frame, though. There's some wacky things you can do with Mercy's movement, but I haven't seen it be a mainstream play that players really do like whipping yourself through the sky to like go take a pistol duel against the pharah or something when i have been up against mercies that have mastered this she is a nightmare to hit as a lot of characters i say that and i absolutely suck at her new movement it's a, a whole new world and i can't unlearn what i remembered from overwatch one for whatever reason more playtime hopefully fixes that changes to moira alex says that a lot of players love her playstyle, so it looks like that's not something that they're going to break with her flow and approachability but maybe give some added utility they have some ideas but it's down the road a bit so i'm going to take that as code for probably not season two where he heavily hinted that we'll see changes to Brigitte's ult in season two, as well as other characters. This won't be one of them. Onto some tanks now. So Alec gets asked, how do you guys feel about the tank diversity, particularly in terms of tanks who share composition style? Ryan, Junker Queen, Zarya, Orisa, all brawl, for example. How much of improving that plays into hero design versus balance versus map design? Alex says it plays a significant role. At the outset of a new hero, we establish what archetype they fit into for the game's needs. The goal here is to have more diversity for different tank playstyles and finding new spaces for that role in general. Shooting barriers will be good for you again, I say with a question mark. Alec, are you trolling me, bro? What do you mean shooting barriers will be good for you again? Is he trying to say we want to be shooting barriers? I'm super confused by this, okay? Are we getting a defensive style tank that isn't all about running in? I think that kind of stands to reason because if you look at how they reworked Doomfist and Orisa, then they added Junker Queen, sort of like we said about supports, it's like they kind of have that area on lock right now. And I think it might make sense to look to the gap in the hero roster. In the same way, I feel like we can almost retroactively look at Kiriko as an example of that, where for a long time, players are talking about lack of mobility options. Lucio's the only speed boost. We know we're getting a tank in season two. Would that one be more of a turret style of play? The only one left like that is Sigma. There was rumors that Maga was leaked as the tank, but I'm going to take it on good authority that that's false. So don't believe those videos and tweets and that's coming from one of the biggest MAGA fans in the world I've been begging for MAGA from the moment he was announced so I think MAGA is more in the style of tank we already have and I don't think that's what we'd be getting season two is not that far away guys we've got November and the start of season two is gonna be December 6th so I bet we start even getting news about this new hero prior to that. Alec gets asked about the balance state of Roadhog responding to a tweet saying that the competition is getting nerfed with Diva and Zarya, but perhaps he's okay. Alec kind of agrees with that, saying these recent changes could be big for Roadhog. We know he also pairs pretty well with Kiriko as she can take care of a lot of his weaknesses, namely getting disabled, she can cleanse. So we are in the wait and see phase, but we have tinkered with some changes to his kit. Nothing we love just yet. Maybe that's something they divulge further. Remember in the 132 experiment, they gave his breather a team AoE effect, which I believe gave them some damage mitigation and healing, if I recall correctly. I think that's a pretty free way to make a tank have team value is just give them something to help the team with. Also one of the fastest ways to make them broken if like commanding shout is too good, for example. I would place Roadhog right now as the severely underrated tier, one that will creep out of the woodwork when Zarya isn't so free and forgiving, I think. Hog has windows to burst Zarya down, remember? And when those windows are open in the next balance state, he might even do okay against her, but against a lot of the other tanks and characters, Hog is pretty nasty, I think. And is one of those picks that just like your skill experience expression can just carry with the role. So I'm a little afraid that they try to give him too much when that's how I feel about him. Maybe that's because I duo with Nateson too much and I've seen the carnage he has wrecked upon my enemies <laughs> far too many times. Further changes to other tanks that are deemed to be in need 
He says they're actively looking at Junker Queen and Wrecking Ball. Queen buffs would look at her self-efficiency versus providing sustain for the whole team. I will say Junker Queen is one of the hardest snowballing win more type heroes in the game. If you have a decent hero matchup against anything with Junker Queen, she is a devastating pick. I have done some outrageous things on this character stomping through the ranks. And if she isn't countered or contested properly, she is a nightmare. If you don't land the no buttons onto Junker Queen, she pops off like no other character I've ever seen. And I think as well, tanks that just give AOE anything to the team as a cast as a super reliable form of value and a lot of players misuse it don't know how to use it or when is the ideal time and waste it oftentimes even though it's a combination of like a mini support ult with similar timings or an accelerator to take a small advantage and snowball it into a massive one which is the best ways to use shout conversely he goes on to talk about wrecking ball which is like the exact opposite end of the spectrum where he says ball is a bit trickier on a knife's edge for balance so wrecking ball is like the exact opposite where he doesn't have any abilities for the team at all he physically has to corral them with his team and it's all movement based and i think he's one of those characters that 90% of the players would prefer never to see in their Overwatch 2 matches if they could help it. Because too often do ball players just go in alone, engage, get nothing out of it, roll out, and the enemy has a tank existing in the front line. And no matter what tank that is, and often it'll be like Zarya or D.Va or something, and it's a super feels bad, unplayable match for the other four squishies of the team. Please don't do that, ball players. <laughs> like your job is to use your movement to sync with your team. If you ever engage out of sync with your team, it's just like such a hard throw. And I think the hero is quite underrated, honestly, but maybe just too hard to play and not enough positive matchups in the meta at the moment. And he doesn't easily kill things on his own like other tanks would. So he's a pure teamwork hero without any teamwork abilities, just movement. So if that's misused, which it often is, he's going to struggle at every rank. But at the same time, Overwatch 2 map design, I feel like, is incredibly beneficial to Wrecking Ball. It is just a massive playground of movement on these maps and especially when you talk about like run back time to the objective all the soft resetting of push maps there's a world where wrecking ball is like oppressive that's probably why he says it's on a knife's edge of balance and for me i think the hardest thing for the devs to balance are roles with a lot of overlap and there's just so many dive tanks and you only get to pick one so I'm not going to ever expect them to all be equally viable at any given season or patch. That's just my take on that. Well, that's going to be it for me, guys. Check out today's video sponsor, the Overwatch League. Streaming live all week, you can earn a lot of free rewards. But as well, don't miss out the Grand Finals on November 4th. Be sure to like the video and hit subscribe and the bell icon to actually get notified when our new videos come out. That's been it for me. I've been Frito for your Overwatch. I'll see you guys next time.